Welcome to the second session of the Resourcing for Success series by Campus Compact. This is a virtual series that we're doing to connect people across our field and across the network with folks within the field who are advancing funding, um, fundraising, friend raising efforts across the work, all aimed at thinking about how we can grow resources to advance civic and community engagement. During the series, we're touching on a bunch of different topics. We're looking at various pathways and approaches to doing this work. Everything from specific programmatic efforts, like fundraising for professorships or internship programs, thinking about how to tap into federal resources, like earmarks, and also to think about the bigger picture. What does it look like to be raising resources for an entire center? And that's where we're gonna to focus today's conversation. I'm so thrilled to have with me three colleagues, all who are sitting at centers or institutes inside their campuses that have received endowments at some period of time. Each of these leaders is going to talk today a bit about the pathway for their center institute into becoming an endowed center institute, but also meaning understanding that that term is pretty heavy and looks different in different campuses. And so we're gonna talk about the different ways that being an endowed center institute play out. What does it mean for operations? What does it mean in terms of how you support faculty and staff development in this work? And how does that translate and um, kind of take shape in the roles, whether you're the executive director, um, you're an associate director, and also for emerging staff who are coming into these programs. I have with me three colleagues from three different institutions and you're gonna hear from each of them. The three folks who are joining us today include Lisa Chambers, who's the Administrative Director for the Mortgage Center for Public Service at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Luke Terra, who's the Associate Director and Director of Community Engaged Learning and Research at Stanford University's Haas Center for Public Service, and Stephanie Kurtzman, who's the Peter G. Sorrentino Executive Director of the Gephardt Institute for Civic and Community Engagement at Washington University in St. Louis. The way we're gonna to run today's session is that I'm gonna ask each of them to do an overview. And in that overview, they're gonna give a bit of history about their Center Institute and also talk about their journey for getting into this work. After that, we're gonna have a group conversation to unpack some more specifics and make sure that we kind of raise up both challenges and lessons learned. So to get started, I'm gonna ask Lisa to go first. Hello all. Um... I'll just start out and hopefully not talk too much, but to give you a bit of a context about the Mortgage Center. So the Mortgage Center's mission is to connect campus and community through community service, service learning, community-based research to build a thriving democratic society. So we stay true to and are pretty mission-driven as an organization. Structurally, I thought I would just get right to the nuts and bolts. Uh, we have a faculty director who's a 50% appointment. I'm the administrative director full-time. Um, kind of support day-to-day -day, uh, running of the center. And then we have 13 professional staff and about 45 student interns that work with us. We have a couple of grad students uh, as part of that 45 student complement. Um, and really just kind of campus and community through course-based course uh, research and teaching, as well as co-curricular initiatives. Um, we're situated at UW-Madison, so we are in a public land-grant institution. We have about 40,000 students um, on campus here. And the Mortgage Center started out, as, as story has it, in almost a closet in the student union a long time ago. Uh, I'll skip right, and it evolved, and the needs. The um, Peace Corps was a big part of UW-Madison's uh, service or civic engagement foundings and has a long history that happened at about the same time. But then around in 1994, the chancellor at that time um, commissioned a committee chaired by our Dean of Students at the time to write a proposal to create an actual university center for community service. The proposal was created with a committee and handed to a couple of wonderful alumni, uh, Tasha and John Morgridge, who were really excited about this proposal and provided a lot of initial support um, for that endowment. 10 years later, they re-upped and kind of challenged the Morgridge Center to pitch in and help do a matching grant up to a million dollars. So we're just very blessed um, to have the support that we have. 
there are no strings attached to our endowment. I just want to put that out there. That's just another gift. Um, our board of advisors definitely helps advise us on the directions that we're taking with the center, but um, we don't have any specific ties connected to our funding. We report structurally to the provost, and at different times, we've had different administrative homes, um, the School of Education before this, but right now uh, through the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning's office. Um, our endowment supports half of the operations of the center. So about, you know, from what we draw down annually combined with core funding from the university, uh, that kind of puts, that is our, the budget that we work from at the Mortgage Center on a day-to-day -day basis. I thought, I, and I believe, Bobby, do you want me to share a bit about my journey or do you want to hold off and that's kind of the next piece? No, I think it'd be great to share a little okay. bit. About you. Okay, so this is kind of the embarrassing part. My my journey, you know, the place I am on this panel is really a learner. I came up through student affairs. So the second day of RA training, I knew I wanted to go into student affairs and I've tried to stay connected to students and their work uh, that whole, through, since that time. So I started out student affairs, different positions. I moved to East Lansing, Michigan at a time in my life because I met my uh, past partner and uh, ended up taking a position with uh, Michigan Campus Compact, many of you are familiar with, as the director. And until that time, fundraising never played a role in my positions. So I, I have not come up um, through fundraising, but that was such an amazing time in my life to work with our presidents on our board of directors. The Kellogg Foundation was very supportive and was a demonstration grant. That's how Michigan Campus Compact was initially formed and funded. So from that time on, I learned a lot about fundraising. It was an important, you know, whether we were talking about dues, you know, membership dues, or we were actively fundraising, that became an important part of my job and something I've really enjoyed doing since then. I think I love what I do. And so it's kind of, it's, it's a gift to be able to share that passion with others who want to play a different role. And for them, it might be, you know, providing funding for keeping us uh, being able to do what we do. That's probably more than enough. <laughs> okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, next, I'm going to ask Luke to share a bit about the Haas Center and his journey to this work. Great, thanks. And great to be with all of you, both uh, my colleagues who I get to be in conversation with and all of you who are joining us. Um, my name is Luke Tara. I'm an associate director at the Haas Center for Public Service, where I lead our community-engaged learning and research work. Um, I've been at the Haas Center for uh, 10 years, um, and I'm going to do my best to share a, a, about our approach to, to donor relations and experience as an endowed center, but just want to recognize that I'm I'm mostly channeling my colleague, Kamba Choni, who um, leads that, that work on our behalf, so I'm going to do my best Kamba impersonation. Um, the Haas Center was established in 1985, um, the same founding year as Campus Compact, and many of the same players involved in both of those. Uh, we were uh, uh, endowed a few years later, around 1989. Our mission is to inspire Stanford to realize a just and sustainable world through service, scholarship, and community partnerships. And so we house both curricular and co-curricular programs um, um, and organize our, our work mainly in areas of curricular uh, programming. We call them cardinal courses, our community-engaged learning courses, internships and fellowships, longer term volunteer engagement and career uh, advising and support. We are now a staff of 35. We have a halftime uh, faculty director, currently Juliet Brody from the law school uh, who serves a five year term and an executive director. Um, in terms of donor relations um, and stewardship, we have an associate director, Kamba and um, two other staff who lead internally our donor relations um, and annual giving, those that team uh, liaises with our university um, development office. And so we've got a really strong relationship there. And as a result, one of the things that might be different 
in, in our center from others is that um, much of the development work is really centralized within both that team internally and in partnership with our um, uh, university development office. And so while all of us as staff are part of stewardship, not all of us as staff are part of either soliciting um, donations or working directly with donors. Uh, we have, a, in addition, just in terms of our overall leadership at the Haas Center, we have a national advisory board that's made up of alumni, donors, other key stakeholders, and university champions that meets quarterly. Um, and we have a faculty steering committee that helps to advise on our strategic direction. In terms of where we sit in the institution, we are part of what we call our vice provost for undergraduate education, which is responsible for the undergraduate curriculum, and the vice provost for graduate education. So we're, we sit on the academic side of the house. That's not always been where we have been organized. We've been in the vice provost for student affairs. We've reported directly to the president. We've had weird other in-between places. So happy to talk more about sort of how you're positioned within the institution and what that means in terms of how you relate both to the donor community that can connect and support your work, but also just fit within the ecosystem of the institution. Um, a few just quick kind of numbers to give you some context on, on the Haas Center. We have an annual budget of around 10 million. About 60% of that comes from endowed funds. Much of that, though, is highly restricted. Um, we have where we've seen the most significant growth in our endowed funds is actually in our, uh, we call our Cardinal Quarter Program or Internships and Fellowships Programs. And I can talk about some of the pros and cons of having pretty highly restricted endowed funds later. Uh, so about 60% comes from endowed funds, about 22% comes from um, annual giving and expendable gifts, 16% comes from university general funds, with an additional 2% from other campus units that co-fund our work. Um, that's a bit different from the initial vision for the Haas Center, which was that it would have a third budget come from the university funds, a third from donor funds, and a third from grants and contracts. That was kind of the original vision of what our budget would look like, and we've we've detoured quite far away from that. So I can also share a little bit more about um, how we got to where we are. Um, in terms of our endowed funding, as with I'm, I'm sure other centers, we have we think of those in three levels. There is annual giving that we have um, and have a strong focus on that. Multi-year pledges, often those are uh, to support and pilot new programs and efforts, and then endowed funds. Um, and yeah, then maybe that's enough for the 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 Haas piece. My own journey into this work. Um, I trained as a secondary history teacher, and for my first kind of part of my career was in the classroom with students. Um, and then I just had an opportunity to go back to my alma mater, Colorado College, and support their service learning work. And um, in some ways, that sort of looked ex like from the outside like a really big career pivot. But to me, it felt like a really natural step because I think as a history teacher, what I was trying to do with students was to help them see themselves as a part of the larger communities that they were in, to see themselves as kind of inheriting traditions and experiences that they were picking up and carrying forward, and to think about how to be active and engaged citizens in the world as they went beyond high school. Um, and what excited me so much about our field, about service learning, was the opportunity to do that and make those kinds of connections um, between the academic content and things that students were learning in the classroom and the ways in which that set them up as active and engaged citizens outside the classroom, but doing that from a variety of disciplinary perspectives. And so it sort of just took the what motivated me about history and then kind of opened that up to different disciplines. So it felt like a really natural home and also opened that up as a career, which I would re never really thought about before. Um, from there, I came here to Stanford for two graduate programs focused on um, civic and history education. And um, as I came out of my doctoral program, uh, Stanford was making this really significant investment in building out a team that could be more supportive and available to faculty to help them make connections to the teaching uh, that they were doing. And they were looking for somebody who was coming from uh, both an education um, doctoral program, but also someone who had experience doing campus community partnerships, which was a, a, a weird configuration of skills that I ha actually had. So it was just sort of the right place, right time. And I got an opportunity to step into the work at the Haas Center. And that was 10 years ago. And um, I've just been really blessed to be a part of this effort on campus. So that's a little bit about where I am. As I mentioned at the top, um, my work is mainly in supporting faculty, students, community partners in the context of academic courses. And so on a stewardship 
perspective. I do some work individually with a few donors who work very specifically with, with our programs, but more broadly, it's about how do we ensure that we can help tell the story to the many people who support our work. And so that's sort of mostly where my day-to-day -day interface with both our external relations team internally and the Office of Development come up. Awesome. Thanks, Luke. Okay, we'll turn to Stephanie now from WashU. Well, hello, everyone. It's really an honor to be part of this panel. And um, it, what's exciting to me is that I think for all of us, it has been such a learning journey. I don't think most people who are um, watching this entered into this work um, in order specifically to do fundraising, but how we can find the connection between fundraising as an opportunity to build capacity and invest in a vision toward the missions that we're all talking about. Um, that's what's really exciting to me. So a bit of background about the Gephardt Institute for Civic and Community Engagement which is at Washington University in St. Louis. We were founded in 2005 by Congressman Gephardt when he um, retired from public office, and he envisioned that the Gephardt Institute be an action tank, not a think tank, to actively prepare and educate young people to become lifelong engaged citizens and civic leaders. So our mission is to foster a thriving culture of civic engagement throughout the university um, and catalyze specifically students learning participation and impact in civic life. Structurally, we have 13 full-time professional staff, usually about 20 student interns and graduate assistants, and a handful of part-time staff and adjunct instructors um, and small group discussion facilitators that are um, paid to support our work. Um, we we do we are one of those centers that is named but not fully endowed. So different than what Lisa was describing, we have a number of endowments that are very generous, um, but we also do um, need to work year to year on fundraising, both to grow more endowments, more major gifts, and more annual gifts to sustain our work. The majority of our programming funding. All of our programming and operating expenses, all of our student stipends, et cetera, comes from donor gifts, usually individual donors. And the majority of our support from the university financially, um, from our central fiscal unit or CFU, uh, is focused on staff compensation, salary and fringe for our full-time staff. Um, I also want to share that structurally, we work very, very closely with university advancement, which um, houses all of the advancement officers for all of the different units and schools throughout the university. And so while we don't have someone on our staff per, on, in terms of an organizational chart that works in advancement, we have a, an advancement officer whose full-time job it is, is to fundraise for the Gephardt Institute. So we work very, very closely with her and also with her many colleagues, particularly as they identify alumni, parents, and other donors whose interests might align with the Gephardt Institute. Um, in terms of my journey, um, I also, like Lisa, have a background in student affairs. My entire career has been spent at Washington University working first to build and lead um, our precursor office, the Community Service Office, and now leading the Gephardt Institute. I've been involved in um, one piece I should mention uh, structurally. I've been very involved with our National Advisory Council or National Council for the past 18 years. Um, while this is not a fundraising body, a number of our major donors also sit on the National Council, and in part because as they become very involved and invested in our work, um, many of them choose to invest further in the Gephardt Institute, and they also, among other things, support our fundraising efforts and our strategy. So I've been involved with that work for many years and directly involved in fundraising for more like eight years. And just want to mention a few of the areas that I'm sure we'll unpack more as we go on in the conversation. Um, the areas that I'm involved with, I probably spend about 50% of my time on fundraising, but that doesn't always mean on the direct asks. That might mean strategy. It might mean um, alumni engagement, donor stewardship, proposal development and report writing, and um, coordinating between our staff at the Gephardt Institute and university advancement staff, 
And I think most importantly, translating our vision and our strategic priorities into fundraising priorities and into something that others can understand and latch into as, again, we're looking for that win-win um, between the, the vision and the interests of a donor and the vision and interests of what we're trying to do at the Gephardt Institute. So I'll pause there and look forward to more conversation to unpack all of that. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, I'm going to bring us all um, back in here, trying to use all my Zoom talents at once. I did it. Hi. So we're all back together. So um, thanks for also, I just want to say like the real honesty and talking about numbers, right? Because I feel like a lot of times when we talk about fundraising, it becomes this kind of broad based conversation without really unpacking like the kind of to what you just said, Stephanie, you know, we're a name center, but that doesn't mean that the endowment covers the full freight of our institute and when the gifts come and how you manage through them. I think part of what we're trying to accomplish here is pulling back the curtain a bit to help folks understand. I also realized that at the beginning of this, I neglected to say why you might be thinking these institutions all seem to be pretty large research universities. And the reason is that this, um, this specific session is actually, we're recording it today, but it was actually something we did live during the trucking convening um, held this past March in Minneapolis. And Truckin is Campus Compact's network of R1 universities. Hence the reflection of everyone being here having a similar institutional context. Um, but we do obviously have some public and private representation here. But that is why we do know that there's um, endowed centers and named centers and institutes that are at non-R1s. Um, and it would be great to get their perspective as well. But this happened to be a specific conversation amongst R1 institutions that we just wanted to make sure we captured on Zoom so that others could hear from it. So we are re-recording it today. So um, I guess the first question I wanna throw out is a bit of a tension point. You know, In doing this work, all three of you talked about particularly coming up through the pathways of student affairs or service learning, You know, Luke talking about being a history teacher. But I also know, happen to know all of you have deep commitments to anti-racism and equity and justice that really centers your work. That's often something I hear about when we're thinking about fundraising and navigating the tensions of advancing the work around equity, sitting inside your institutional you know, um, own identities, but then also just doing that work. I'd love for you to unpack a little bit about how that plays out, how you navigate it, um, what are the some ways that you think about it, and you know, how do you move forward? Well, I will begin. Um, I'm sorry that Mary Jo is not um, on this call. She was part of our original session and had a lot of really valuable commentary to bring in. Um, I think that a lot of people have um, a, an image in their mind that philanthropy is uh, is a power dynamic and that donors um, can can or do control and drive the, the mission of the work. Um, I do think it's really important to acknowledge that, but I, and I also think it's very important that as, um, as leaders that we are really clear in driving um, the priorities and the values of our organizations so that the, the funds that come in or that we're discussing with prospective donors are very aligned with not only our mission, but in our commitments to equity and to the student body and the communities that we serve and engage with. Um, because uh, if you're not very, very clear, there's a risk that um, the, you know, rather than the, the, the cart starts driving the force. Um, and I think that's an issue, not only in terms of equity and justice, but also a potential issue just with mission creep and staying within the lane of what we each are here to do within our institutions. Um, so I think that's, that's one point I would make. I also think it's important to acknowledge that um, particularly when we're talking about major gifts, much of the wealth in our country is held by people who have traditional forms of privilege, um, who are often white um, and who often come from wealth or are in fields that helped them build their wealth. And oftentimes their identities don't align with the populations that we're engaging with, both in the community and within our student populations. Um, I really try to look at the intent of the donor and where their vision and their values lie. 
um, understanding that many and many and if not most of them have deep commitments to equity and to the values that we hold at the Gephardt Institute. I do think it's important that um, we help our students understand that and bridge that gap. You know, we've had students of color say, you know, I was um, delighted to be in the room where our National Advisory Council was meeting, but I noticed that I was in the minority, right? And that our council didn't quite look like the rooms I'm used to sitting in when I'm among students and even staff at the university. And that's an important point to acknowledge and also an important point to invite him to consider what role he will play in the future as he becomes an alumni who can actually add to the diversity of voices in those spaces, even as we're continuing to build that strategy while he's still a student. So I'm gonna pause there and invite Lisa and Luke to offer further insights. I can add just one piece I would add on the, um in terms of, of aligning gifts with our commitments to equity and justice. I think one of the one of the learnings that we've had, I mean, I, I think we probably learn it over, it's a lesson we continue to learn over and over again is the importance of um, framing gift opportunities in ways that preserve the flexibility and adaptability of our staff to be able to meet the needs that we see um, and the opportunities that we see. And, um, and so I think the as we approach trying to lay out ways in which folks can support our work, we want to do that in a way that allows for us to have the prerogative to channel those in ways that we think are going to be most effective and and to us are going to meet and align with our goals around equity and justice. So, for example, um, one of our uh, uh, efforts that we've launched three years ago is called Place, uh, Partnerships for Climate Justice in the Bay Area that's working specifically with frontline communities impacted by climate change in our local region. Um, but from a development standpoint, even though that's a very kind of like justice forward, frontline community forward initiative, the way that we frame that as a development opportunity for, for folks who support our work is under the umbrella of community engaged learning and research. And so we're looking to just bring additional capacity to that and then deploy that in ways that we think are gonna be most effective at making a difference for the communities that are most impacted by those issues. And so I think depending on your institutional context, depending on sort of how you want to approach this from a development perspective, um, when you have donors who meet you in that with that same values orientation, you can frame it in that way and that may resonate for them in a really powerful way. And also you may have folks who sort of the, the, the part of that that they align with you is around a sort of general interest in supporting community engagement among your students. And from my perspective, if sort of that's where they enter the conversation, great. Uh, and as long as I can preserve some room within the gift language to be able to do that in ways that align with our values as an organization and where we want to do our best work, um, then that's sort of a place where we can hopefully find that win-win, uh, even if they're not fully on board with the vision that we have for any particular initiative. I want to come back to the gift language point in just a sec. Lisa, anything to add? I don't have anything that would, yeah, add to what they've shared. Awesome. Well, Lisa, why don't um, I start with you then on this next question, which I know we've talked about in the past, and that is around stewardship. You know, we've, I think each one of you mentioned, you know, when you think about your role um, in this work and within your center institute, part of it's about stewardship. And so, you know, not making any assumptions if people understand what that word means, since we're starting with you, Lisa, why don't you also just talk about what stewardship means to you, and then maybe even a couple of specific examples of how you um, kind of oversee or ensure that you're doing stewardship within the frame of the Mortrade Center. Yes, happy to. And this isn't an official um, definition, but what stewardship means to me is it just feels like we're um, fortunate enough to have a gift uh, given to the Mortgage Center. And I think we want to make sure that we are the best stewards of the gift. So you know, spending funds in ways that obviously align with um, the donor agreement, align with the mortgage, mortgage center's mission, vision, values, and our strategic plan, making sure we're really um, being responsible with, the, with those funds, and also stewarding the relationships. So for me, it's all about, and that looks so differently. It looks so different, you know, in every single example, there are probably that many or 
instant, you know, instances there are that many different examples of what stewardship looks like. But um, I, we do try to make an effort to connect back with folks who have donated. So just folks, you know, that um, maybe have a one-off small donation or it's a monthly small donation to, to very large, you know, contributions or larger contributions. We try to send like a handwritten note to those folks at the end of each month, just to thank them for the gift and um, let them know how we plan to use it. We've invited folks to our end of the year celebration. We have a Be the Change Bash annual celebration where we give out awards. And um, two folks who are responsible for a family donation come every year to give that award out. So it's just a way for us to continue to keep them involved in they hear the stories, the great stories of the students that receive those awards. They're able to be in community with us to celebrate, um, which is really wonderful. We have, so Tasha Morgridge does still serve on our board as a permanent member. Um, she has attended um, job talks for some of our staff when things are online, which were wonderful. And just, you know, taking the opportunity to stay connected, I feel is invaluable. Another example, tiny example is, you know, meeting for lunch with somebody who's local, who lives here in Madison. And she will literally just drop in or she'll say, let's go to lunch. And she's like, tell me what you're doing, you know, and it's just a fun way to, to stay involved and engaged. So I think on um, personal examples, those are, are things that come quickly to mind. Um, as well as we do some more formal work with um, sending out newsletters and things just to make sure folks know that they're connected and that we're listening to what they're interested in. Anybody else have any examples as to what stewardship looks like? I mean, I would just add plus one that sort of thinking about it, both stewarding, stewarding the funds and the gifts that we receive, making sure that we're being um, that we're using that really effectively and can report that back and tell the story of impact and then also stewarding the relationships. And I guess the, the emphasis for us is on the relationship piece, recognizing that any individual gift is just sort of one moment in a longer relationship that we're maintaining. Um, and our, our external relations folks talk about having aiming for seven touch points with a, a donor before any ask, just to, to make sure that we're always um, focused on maintaining the relationship and not just going to somebody with a particular ask. And then that uh, that sort of focus on relationship, I think also encourages us to be pretty flexible and adapted to what they're looking for and what ways they want to be engaging with us. So it means we do certainly have the same kinds of like, you know, we got newsletters that can go to anybody and 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 modes of communication that would be pretty consistent regardless of how frequently or how much you've given to the host center, but then we also are, are trying to create different paths and opportunities for engagement in our work and plugging them in in ways that make the most sense for them. So for example, that might mean that uh, um, uh, a donor has lunch with student, you know, a donor who's in New York has lunch with students who are doing internships over the summer in New York. And that's like a way of connecting because their, their motivation for being connected to the host center is because of the memory they have as a student and wanting to pay it forward and support the, the experiences of our students. And so having that touch point with students is really the most helpful and effective for them. For another, it might be being a part of our national advisory board because what they're really excited about is offering their guidance on the strategic direction of the Haas Center. And so that's a way of connecting. So just being, I think, flexible to look for how our um, stakeholders, donors, alumni, champions want to be involved and sort of to, to the best that we can without getting in the way of our programs, how do we sort of create openings and opportunities for them to engage with us? Because if we're allowed to cultivate that kind of an authentic relationship, then the, the forms of financial support are going to flow from it. Awesome. Can you say again what the seven touch points were? Or, you yeah, know, so just, yeah, it was just... It, it's just like a, a kind of mental, there's nothing magic about seven, but it's just like the mental reminder that we want to be thinking about having seven touch points with any of our donors between an ask. So it's not that we're only reaching out to them when, because we have, hey, there's this really exciting program that I know is connected to your interests. Would you, would you like to talk more about that? Um, it's saying, you know, we've, we've made that ask and now we want to think about, okay, what's the next, what's the next seven things that are not at all going to be related to an ask that just give them opportunities to learn more about us, engage with us and our students, maintain that 
and deepen that connection with us so that the balance of their interactions with us are not specific asks for support, but are opportunities to connect. That's great. That's great. You know, you hear a lot about, you know, in the um, in the spaces that we're in around just the amount of touch points before an ask is made, right? But that's interesting to think about that framing of stewardship in between. I Something that just occurs to me that I don't think we talked about in our in-person gathering um, is that it sounds like all of you have mentioned boards. So I just wanted to get like confirmation. So I definitely, as uh, as Stephanie was talking, I pulled up to look at her National Advisory Council that is definitely just associated with the Get Part Institute. So do you each also have national boards just for your centers or institutes? So Lisa's saying no. So Lisa, yours is not, you don't have a... Local. So faculty, staff, students, community partners, large, small nonprofits, for-profits in Madison, um, municipal folks, dean of students, you know, some positional and undergrads. So two undergrads and two grad students. So just trying to hit all of our different constituents. The more of a traditional kind of community advisory board, which I think we hear more often within like the field. Luke, what about you at the Haas Center? Yeah, the Haas Center has a very active and engaged national advisory board. Um, there's probably maybe 40-ish members. Um, they meet quarterly, although the winter meeting is typically virtual. So we have them on campus fall and spring. Um, and that board involves both undergraduate and graduate student members, which is wonderful. So, and that, and I, I think that's a real highlight for our national advisory board members is that, you know, if you imagine when we're all gathered in our in our fall meeting and we do breakouts, they're always going to have a student who's there because so often, if we're asking for input from our board about, you know, here are some directions that we're interested in pursuing, the first question they ask is, well, what do students think about this? And so having students at the table has actually been, I think, a really important ingredient there. Um, and the board is is um, uh, has I mean, we've just had tons of interest from our um, alumni. It's a great service opportunity for them. Um, so that's that has just been a, a just a fantastic part of our infrastructure, having that group to turn to. And many of them are active donors and supporters of our work. Um, and so that's it. Also gives them a kind of way of seeing the day to day of our work that they wouldn't otherwise get a chance to see. Awesome. Okay, um, just a few more questions. And, you know, in the frame of Zoom and technology, Stephanie is doing her best to come in and come out, and I think to make Wi-Fi work for her. Um, so we'll we'll get her back in um, if and when we can make that happen. But just a question on another, like Luke and, and Lisa, you both just talked about coming from other spaces, right? Like you didn't seek out to be a fundraising professional, nor do I think anyone in our field, at least that I know of, has taken that path. How do you think about growing your own sort of professional development in this, but also your team? Like, what does that look like um, for you and particularly in your role as a leader in a leadership role? We can start quickly. And I know Stephanie has a pretty robust mm -hmm. uh, example. So I hate to, I, would, I don't want to take up much space. Personally, I've done a lot of professional development. So literally taken advantage of many opportunities to learn more about fundraising and uh, and that whole world. And I do feel like folks are generous. So community foundation executive, you know, there are people who are really generous when they know what you're doing, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, there are faculty on campus, you know, whose discipline area is in philanthropy. So there, I've really just tried to take advantage of as many professional development opportunities personally. And then I think for staff involving them, and I think you said this, Luke, you know, specifically around the storytelling and the stewardship and anytime I'm writing proposals, um, they're just tapped very frequently to, to help share the specific stories. Um, I, yeah, I think, for us, and this might be um, just thinking about for, for folks who might be watching and thinking about how to structure this within their own center, there's some trade-offs that happen. Like for us, we have this, we have a dedicated external relations team that really takes on most of the um, direct engagement with our donors. And that has some tremendous advantages. One is that we have trained <laughs> fundraisers in a fundraising role, and we're not relying on someone like me to try to figure out uh, a field that's really robust and established and has lots of best practices that I'm not as, as um, trained up on. 
Um, the, the downside is that um, uh, it can be easy for other program staff to not feel the same ownership over that process. And so I think for us, the what we have to be more intentional about, and I, I don't know that this is something we, we get right all the time, but is helping our staff whose programs depend on the generosity of our donor community to know how they can contribute and tell the story and make that the impact of that uh, of those gifts apparent and communicate those to our to our donors in ways that just sort of like put wind at the back of our external relations team. So, you know, if you're if you're thinking about this as a center of like do we have somebody dedicated, do we have that just sort of distributed throughout the center? Just to be mindful of some of the the trade-offs, it's all manageable. All 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 versions of it can work perfectly well. Uh, but just recognizing that at least in our case, the the where we've had to then sort of lean in on is making sure that staff know what their development responsibilities are if it's not to have those direct engagements with our donors and ensuring that they have a sense of ownership and a feeling of responsibility to be able to hold that and contribute um, in those different ways. Awesome. And in the event that Stephanie is not able to rejoin us, I would just say, I know that something she mentioned, we were together in person that I thought was powerful is that she's actually come up with real language that is kind of boilerplate to ensure that it's embedded into every job description in the Institute. And, you know, I think it is something that we all think about doing the work. What does it look like for our whole staff to take on um, the mission of fundraising or storytelling in this case, um, or both? But in um, Stephanie's case at WashU, she's really been discreet about that and saying that like she really has clarity around this is a part of every job and each position might have it more heavily weighted depending on their role, but they do have, she does have language that's really integrated into every job description for all the staff, um, which I think is something that we can all benefit from um, and kind of hearing that as an example. Well, I think that we're just about ready to wrap. I guess I wanted to ask Luke um, and Lisa, if you just have any sort of kind of last thoughts on what it takes to be successful with this or just kind of the mindset that folks should have, particular peers who are getting started or they might be or they, they might be in an institution where they're thinking about um, making this a priority um, and going after that major gift to endow their center institute. I, I can hop in. There's lots that, that I would say. A couple, couple things to that from our perspective, lessons learned that that I would encourage folks to think about. Um, one is, and this has been a little bit, you know, this has been sort of lightly suggested throughout the time, but to just make sure that our development needs and goals don't uh, end up wagging the be, being the tail that wags the program dog. Uh, I think I may have just butchered that, but um, you know what I mean. <laughs> Making sure that. We're, we're really staying true to our mission first and that we're articulating our goals and where we want to go clearly. And then from there, looking for opportunities for others to support our work, but being careful not to shift off course of that in order to entertain um, a gift opportunity. Those just That just rarely ends well. So one, being really true to who you are and what you want to do, and then ensuring and, and trusting that folks are going to want to come forward and support that work. And then the second is that as you get to that opportunity to to, to to make an ask for and, and secure an endowed gift, um, to give yourself as much flexibility as you can in that. I think where we have found ourselves stuck is when we have um, said yes to an overly restrictive gift that really ties our hands. Uh, and so really uh, thinking creatively about um, how you can add flexibility in that gift language that opens up some possibilities for you. I mean, think like this is something that generations after us in 150 years are going to have to be managing like is that going to still be a, a a persuasive and impactful purpose for that gift in that time and how can we ensure that their language is flexible enough that we can adapt as circumstances change and even if that means saying like we know this gift is going to be used for this with a preference for dot 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 whatever that thing is that that donor is really passionate about so that we know that our first hope is to be able to channel it into that very specific thing but we also recognize that that may not in perpetuity be possible. And so we want to give ourselves some flexibility. My colleague Kamba talks about endowed gifts as tattoos. So think of them as like, these are things that are going to be with you. It is possible to get them removed or changed, but it is very painful. So make sure that like, if you're going to go for it, that you feel really comfortable and confident in that language. Thanks, Luke. I'm so glad you brought it back. I wanted to come back to the gift language. So that's what I was thinking of. I knew you had something really helpful to frame. So Stephanie, welcome back to our little Zoom world here. 
<laughs> While you were gone, we were talking about professional development and I channel, just in case you want to add anything to it. I did mention that I thought I loved that you had talked about really weaving in that kind of boilerplate language into every job posting. So mm-hmm. we'd both ask if you have anything you want to add to the kind of that question, which was like, how do you make sure your staff's prepared to advance this work? Yeah. And then the last question was really around like, what should, what's the right mindset or what do you think just people need to have as we close the session today? So sure. Here. Sure. My grand apologies for my tech issues. And those things even happen with donors. So, you, you know, I think it's a good lesson in being human, right? We, we are two humans, three humans, however many it is, talking with one another about things that we care about. And sometimes the technology does get in the way. Um, but that said, I, I really do want to go back to this concept that um, I, I don't consider fundraising a burden. I consider it a privilege. Um, and and a, a really interesting foray into an area of work that I certainly didn't anticipate going into. It doesn't mean it's not work and doesn't mean it doesn't take a lot of careful thought and careful relationship building, but to get to sit with people and talk about the things that they really, really care about and that they're really concerned about in the world and to hear among so many of them that they really see the work that we do as an outlet to act on their concerns and that they would choose to invest their resources, whether that's $10, $100, a million dollars. We all like the million dollars, but the truth is those 20 and those hundred dollars, et cetera, add up. But every single one of those people made a choice among a lot of choices to invest in us. And that's an incredible honor. And I sometimes sit back and think, I get paid to sit and listen to people talk, really interesting people talk about what they're really passionate about and talk about the work I'm passionate about. Um, So that is, I I hope, a helpful mindset to think not of it as a drudge or a burden. I also would say that it's opened up a lot of opportunities for us to think bigger and act bigger because of the resources that we've been able to secure. Um, To your comment, Bobby, about um, weaving into job descriptions, I really do view that this is a full team effort. And whether that's folks who work on the back end, who make our work go and make our work look good that allows us to have the successes that um, help us tell the stories that we tell and both attract donors, but also steward the gifts and show those outcomes um, to those who are working on the front lines with our various stakeholders, namely students and community partners. We are all involved and um, we make that really clear from the get-go when we are job searching, that everybody is involved in fundraising, fundraising strategy, and we specify what that might look like. We also do a lot of professional development and education because it may not be the backgrounds that folks specifically came from. Um, But the most important thing I would leave you all with is this concept that these are not competing missions or goals. We are, for us, one institute, we have one mission, and we pursue that in multiple ways. One way is through our frontline work with our stakeholders. One way is through our operations. And one way is through building our capacity in order to do the work. But when we set those things up as odds, that it's fundraising or student education, it's fundraising or community partnerships, that's where we can get ourselves into trouble in our mindset as well as our actions. When we can get everybody working in synergy, then really beautiful things can happen through this fundraising work. Oh, sorry. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. I think you covered it. Great. Lisa, do you want to close this out? I just don't have much to add. I think I just go right to relationships. And it feels like even when you're, you know, even across campus, even if I somebody doesn't reach out to me directly because they've heard about the work of the Mortgage Center, can we meet? Sometimes it's knowing somebody else on campus and someone reaches out to them and they're not able to meet the need for a specific donor. So they'll connect with us at the mortgage center. And as much as it feels like oh, giving away a potential gift, it just helps them help people who are connected to them in a different way. So I don't know if that made sense, but it's an opportunity to, to support each other across campus um, through relationships. So. I do feel like it is such a fun thing to be able to do. Um, If you believe in what you're doing and the work of your center and you have stories and you have um, ways to share those with individuals, there's, it's just really one of the best things. And I think too, 
I feel really blessed to be able to work at the Mortgage Center. Some of our donors, they have other jobs that are doing other things in other places of the world, but it, it's a way for them to stay connected in a really direct way and influence the work that we're doing, but it's just, it's through a donation or a gift uh, rather than the direct hands-on kind of day-to-day -day work. So it takes a, takes a village yeah. to play an important role. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Luke, Stephanie, and Lisa. And as Stephanie said, when we did this in person, we also had Mary Jo Callen from Brown University, who also added so much to our conversation. I do want to say that this is a community of folks who are here to support each other. And I do know that I'm not talking out of turn by saying that there's a colleague who's wrestling with this, that everybody here, um, as well as our entire team at Compact, stands at the ready to support and lean in, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or just sharing resources or however we can help. So um, thanks. And we look forward to continuing to talk about fundraising to advance civic and community engagement. Thank you. Thank you.